I'd like to begin by looking at two portions of the scripture, one from the Old Testament, one from the New. First, Psalm 86, verse 13. This is, this is what Pastor Peyton was transliterating for you this morning here. You have always been great toward me. What love? And that translates into, how did you say it? Yippee. Yippee. That's good. You got it. And then the second very familiar passage, John 3.16, many of us learned from childhood. Read it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. How many of you were taught the song, Jesus loves me as a child? Okay. So you can finish this line. Jesus loves me, this I know. That's right. We all heard it expressed in a lot of different ways. The idea that God loves you. Sometimes on the telephone or in sincere uh, television evangelists say, God loves you and so do I. And you think, you don't even know me. And, if, and then they, we often think, well, if you knew me, you might not love me. So you better withhold judgment on that. I believe from years through the years and early years of my life that the song was right. Jesus loves me, this I know. For what? The Bible tells me so. But I was 20, son, before it dropped the 18 inches from my head to my heart, where I really opened myself to what God had for me. That's why a lot of us have a hard time grasping, believing, accepting God's absolute, unconditional love for us. There are all kinds of reasons that we don't receive and trust or even see God's love. It's different from person to person, but there are things that happen in our lives that cause us to miss out. For some of us, me included, it had a lot to do with my relationship with my own father, and that's number one in outrageous love, dad and Abba. Look at Matthew 7, verse 11. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? The whole idea of being wanted by my father was sort of a foreign thing to me. I, I, I sort of felt that was more tolerated by my father than wanted by my father. After all, it was my dad that taught me I was stupid and worthless. There's that phrase, I'll never forget it. Some of you even knew it. I, when I was going through a therapy session once, the guy that was doing that with me said, oh, I know that, my dad said the same thing to me. And what he said was, if you had a brain, you'd take it out and play with it. You know, after a while, you, as a little kid, you keep hearing that, you think, of course, anyway, anyway. My goal in our relationship was to not annoy my father. The first time I remember a feeling of affection from him is when I was 40 years old. It was my 40th birthday, and he had just become involved in AA, and it was his one month of sobriety, and I was happy about that. And he called to tell me that he loved me, and that was the first time I could ever remember hearing that. He was calling to make amends for the things that he had caused in our family. But most of the time, my goal for my dad was not to annoy him. The only time he was sober for most of my early life was when it was in the morning when it was time for him to go to work and we were about ready to go to school and who wanted to start a conversation then? I believed with all my heart that he loved me, but he just, he just didn't know how to show it. Nobody ever told him that they loved him when he was a kid. And you learn it from your family. I can't sugarcoat it now, that relationship with him and how it somehow negatively affected my view of who God was for a long time. Even though I sang the song in Sunday school where I went every week. It wasn't until after my dad's death that I learned about his pain and his woundedness that I began to understand how he struggled with a whole bunch of guilt and a whole bunch of shame about things that happened in his life in the past. And I understood better when my first son was born, David, how I was looking forward always to coming home from work 
and how he would run and jump into my arms. My desire for my children's love was very strong and it, it opened my eyes to what God must be hoping for to receive from us. I mean, after all, I'm an earthly, sinful, and perfect father, and I love my children. And now that I'm a grandfather, that love just magnified. I never expected that. How can I not trust such a perfect God who loves me infinitely more than I could ever love my children to be there? Outrageous love, number two, in love with the one that I fear. Look at Psalm 87, verse 13. I worship you in joyful fear. Now, I'm sorry, but those two words just don't go together very well, do they? They just don't matriculate in our mind or in our heart. Joyful fear? Most Christians have been taught by their parents or somebody else that they have to set aside a daily time, a quiet time for prayer and reading the Bible, listening to God. I valiantly tried to do that in my early years, and I tried and I tried, but I would fail, and then I would feel guilty, and I would fail, and then I would feel guilty. Pastor Francis Chan puts it in perspective this way. Over time, I realized that when we love God, we naturally run to Him frequently and zealously. Jesus didn't command us to have a daily quiet time with God. He says we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, with all of our mind. He called this the first and the greatest commandment. The results of intimate prayer are a desire to do things that we didn't want to do. I'll never forget the week after having what I would call experience of conversion when I was 20 something and, and God's love dropped from my head to my heart, I had an insatiable desire to read the Bible. I never did that before. I mean, I started, you know, you start with Genesis chapter one and you get about halfway through there and you bog down and you think, well, I'll finish that tomorrow. And then we don't get around to it. And we feel guilty about the fact that we didn't. But all of a sudden, It's so powerful when your ought to's become want to's and you think, and you scratch your head and you think, wow, something's going on inside of me. This is how God longs for us to respond to his unconditional, extravagant, unending, outrageous love. And now when my grandson arrives, as soon as the car motor goes off, the seat belts off and the door opens and he runs into the house And he runs and jumps into my arms like my kids used to do. And I know it's only one reason. It's because he loves me. Is fear the word we want to use to describe how we feel about God? How about reverent intimacy? We still fear God in some ways we always will. And maybe there's something healthy about that. Outrageous love. Number three, wanted. Just before last summer when I took my sabbatical, which I'm very grateful for, a friend of mine here enveloped me in her arms, almost broke my ribs as a matter of fact, and she prayed this prayer, God, I know you wanted this time with Denny. I thought, let me go, wait a minute. That's not the right kind of prayer to pray. That God wants time with me, it's the other way around. I need to have time, I want to have some time with him. And although I didn't say it, I wanted to say to her, you're wrong. This is, this is improper. It seemed demeaning to think that the God who created the universe wants to have time with a pitiful little human being like me. But look at Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. In other words, God knew us before he made us. What's even more, he's determined to make us what we are so that we can do what it is he has a plan for us to do. Part of that comes out of Ephesians 2 verse 1. It says, we are God's workmanship 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared. What's that word? In advance, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That verse is meant for you and for everybody who is saved by grace through faith. Your existence is not random. You're not here today at this particular time, at this particular place by accident. God knew he was creating and he designed you for a very specific work. Many people today look at their lives and they weigh their sin against their good deeds. Maybe you picked it up too. You know that picture you're going up to the pearly gates and St. Peter's sitting there with the book. The radio evangelists call it the Lamb's Book of Life, brother. You have to look to see if your name's in here. Beside your name, now this is, this is me, not the Bible. Beside your name are X's and O's. And if you don't have enough O's to balance out your X's, you're going to go to the other place. And I don't know where I got that. Some of you are shaking your head no. Keep shaking it. That's, that's not biblical. But somehow I picked it up that my good stuff and my bad stuff better be in balance or I'm going to have a big problem when I get there. There will be no room in the end. Look at Isaiah 64, 6. Well, let me back up. Let me say again. Many people today look at their lives and they weigh their sins against their good deeds. And that's where Isaiah knew there was a problem. All the, our righteousness, he says, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. 